Shalom and welcome to Zadok Calendar in the Dead Sea Scrolls, Part 4, Calendars and Intercalation. Let's look at some religious calendars and then we will take a closer look at the Zadok Calendar and compare it with some of the other Enoch and Dead Sea Scroll based calendars currently being proposed. As always, I hope we can remain friends, even if we disagree over the calendar details. A Straight Solar Calendar the Gregorian calendar is the closest calendar to a straight solar calendar which does not use the stars to divide the year into equal months of 30 days. Although the number of months is still 12, they are randomly divided from 28 to 31 days each as a result of the dueling ancient Roman Caesars. A true solar calendar will always require intercalation because of the 366th day every fourth year, which on the Gregorian calendar is added at the end of February as a 29th day. This fact alone proves that the true beginning of years should occur in March based on the vernal equinox and not 10 days after the winter solstice because intercalated days are applied at the end of the year. The 366th day first appears at the autumnal equinox, which is about halfway through the year. This shift of two and a half months from March back to January makes the Gregorian not quite a literal solar calendar. But apart from this shift, which makes the years begin in January, the Gregorian calendar is almost a literal straight solar calendar. It is the closest calendar to a literal solar year, and it proves that a solar calendar will always require two things, calculation and intercalation. The 366th day intercalation on the Gregorian calendar is called a leap day, and the years in which it occurs are called leap years. The names of the months are Roman in origin, However, the number of days in a week are not. The ancient Romans followed an eight-day week, but later changed this to the Hebrew seven-day week. Ancient Roman records before the Common Era in BCE record that the Jews in Judea observed every seventh day as their Sabbath, which occurred on what the Romans called Saturnalia. Saturday is simply what the Romans called the seventh day of the Hebrew week. This is where we get the name Saturday on our current Roman calendar. These ancient records are displayed in the British Museum. Some scholars believe that of the seven planets, the planet of Saturn initially meant rest, which was why the Jews were viewed by the Romans as keeping a Saturnalia each week when they rested. The ancient Babylonian calendars also recognize the seventh day as distinct, depicting it as separate from the other weekdays. The ancient Babylonians also viewed this day as a day of rest on their lunar calendar. It's astonishing to see that the word for the seventh day across virtually all languages and cultures depicts some adapted form of Sabbath or Shabbat and literally means rest. So what is intercalation? To intercalate is the process of adding in between days called intercalary days to a calendar system for the express purpose of preserving the calendar within the proper seasons. Remaining as close as possible within the proper seasons is a requirement for any biblical calendar because it is agricultural in design and function. Solar, lunar, or stellar calendars all require a system of intercalary days to remain properly aligned with the seasons. It's obvious that a straight 360-day stellar calendar requires five or six intercalary days to realign with spring each year. A straight solar calendar requires an intercalary day every fourth year due to the 366th day between the vernal equinoxes, which is why the Julian calendar had to be replaced with the Gregorian calendar as it had drifted out of season. 
A straight lunar calendar has no ability to align with the seasons. The lunar solar calendar requires 30 days every third year to catch back up and realign with the spring. So the biblical calendar is based on three units of time, according to Genesis 1.14, which I discussed in greater detail in the part three video. First, the four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter, with four renewal days, which are the days of the solar signs. The second is days, counted in units of seven, for 52 units per year. 52 is 5 plus 2, which equals 7. And third, years, counted in units of seven in the Bible. Shemitahs, seven years, and Jubilee cycles, which are seven times seven. The predominant number, as you can see above, are four and seven. Four plus seven equals 11. If you will recall from my video, The Covenant of Fire, Part 1, the oneness of Yah Elohim is depicted in the letter Aleph, which equals 1, 1, 1. So we shouldn't be surprised to see a reduction of this number in the biblical calendar pointing us towards the Shema, which says that Yah is 1. 1, 1 pointing to 1 equals 1, 1, 1. The biblical year is determined by four seasons, which occur between the four solar signs, the two equinoxes, and the two solstices. The biblical day is determined by the movement of the sun and stars, which act as two witnesses or signs, one during the daytime and the other during the nighttime. The biblical year requires that the sun and stars agree on the completion of a year. A Kodesh, or renewal days, of the seasons are averaged by the 360-degree circle of the stars. So we see that we have 30 plus 30 plus 30, and then one seasonal change day, and then 30 plus 30 plus 30, and another seasonal change day. We add it all together, and we get 364 days. Because the 365th and 366th days are signposts which do not count as part of the biblical calendar, we have basically two options on how to deal with these days when they occur. First, we can count them as one or two additional intercalary days each year for a total of five or six intercalary days per year. This method is commonly referred to as the Enoch calendar and it shifts the weekdays forward before beginning the seven-day count once again in the fourth gate of the spring season. This breaks the backbone cycle of the seven days per week, creating one week each year when there are eight to ten days between the weekly Sabbath. And yes, it absolutely does break the weekly cycle. There is nothing to indicate a separate calendar that begins again after the spring equinox. And on a straight seven-day weekly calendar, the equinox shifts forward because mathematically 365 and 366 will always shift your weekday forward. Secondly, we can ignore the additional 365th and 366 days until you can intercalate a full unit of seven days at one time so that the seven-day weekly Sabbath remains unbroken. This method is called the Zadok calendar, and it collects all of the extra days until the vernal equinox no longer occurs before the end of the 364th day, signaling the end of the biblical year. Then, a unit of seven days is inserted at one time to keep the seasons and the gates in their proper order of entry for a total of 11 days, 1-1. One, one. From a spiritual sense and a Torah perspective, I reject option one due to the breaking of the seven-day cycle and the Sabbath being shifted forward because mathematically, you have to shift it forward one day when there's 365 days in a year. You certainly don't have to agree with me, but I view the breaking of the covenant sign 
which the seven-day cycle represents, as a violation of the fourth commandment. The Hebrew word for seven is the root word for an oath. Shavua, meaning oath. From the root word shavah, a primitive root properly to be complete. Also, it means to seven oneself or swear as if by repeating a declaration seven times. It's a sevenfold oath. The first time Shavua is used in the Bible is when Abraham sends his servant to seek a wife for his son Isaac. Isaac, of course, is a picture of Yeshua, and in this account, Abraham is clearly a picture of Yah Elohim seeking a bride for his son. Yes, that's right. It's used in the context of Yah seeking a bride for his son, Yeshua. In Genesis 24, 1 through 9, And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and Yah had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house, that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear, or shava, by Yah, the Elohim of heaven, and the Elohim of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham said unto him, Beware thou that thou bring not my son thither again. The Yah Elohim of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear a Shiva unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my shavua, my oath. Only bring not my son thither again. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swear, or shava, to him concerning that matter. So Isaac's bride was brought to Isaac four years after his mother Sarah died. At the end of a thousand years, the new Jerusalem descends on the fourth day from when Yeshua died, and eternity begins. Notice that the angel is the one who went before the servant to collect the bride, just as we read that the angels will gather Yah's elect from the four corners of the earth, and they will rule and reign with him for one thousand years. Like Rebecca accepted gold bracelets, the elect will receive crowns. The number seven is a sign between us and Yah Elohim. It's our wedding ring. Therefore, I personally believe that this oath spans all time, seasons, days, and years, as a picture of the enduring promises Yah has made to his people, the children of Abraham. This promise is again repeated directly to Isaac in Genesis 26, 3-5. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath, Shavua, which I swear, Shava, unto Abraham thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because that Abraham obeyed my voice, and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. The number seven represents Yah's covenant with his people, which he cannot break, his sevenfold promises. When Yah makes an oath, there is a unit of seven involved. Seven days of creation, Noah in the ark for seven days, the rainbows, seven colors, Moses leading the people out of Egypt during the seven days of Passover and unleavened bread, 
Moses being called up to Mount Sinai on the seventh day, and of course Yeshua dying as the sacrifice for mankind on the same seven days of Passover and unleavened bread as Israel came out of Egypt. The seven-day cycle of the Sabbath, the seven-yearly cycle of the Shemitah or the sabbatical years, and the seven times seven cycle of Jubilees, and the Feast of the Seventh Month, when Yah shows that he accomplishes his word. And, of course, the 70th week, when the elect are perfected and then gathered by the angels to meet Yeshua as he returns. These are my primary reasons for intercalating only in units of seven days and keeping each year 364 days. If year one began on day four in the creation week, which we know that it did based on Genesis 1.14, then a 364-day year can never shift away from the fourth day being Abib 1 throughout eternity. So it's my personal opinion that if we intercalate five or six days every year, then we break the 364-day cycle. But if we intercalate a full unit of seven days every five or six years, which the additional fifth and sixth days seem to hint at doing, then we have an unbroken covenant-based calendar. The luminaries point us to Yah who established his oaths and covenants using the number seven. He chose that number for himself, and the observation of the luminary cycles independently can never institute the number seven. Only Yah could do that at creation through his word alone. This is why the number seven is a sign of his divine authority, which is higher than what we can ever observe with our eyes. His ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. In fact, his ways and thoughts are higher than ours, and his oaths, like the number seven, are unchanging and complete. I was raised observing the Sabbath. While I didn't know or understand biblical calendars, I understood that every seventh day was a sign between me and Yah that I submitted to His authority over my life. His authority wasn't predicated on what I could see with my eyes around me, but only on the fact that He alone was my Elohim, and He said so. When the calendar question was raised, I rejected many different calendars for years because they violated his sovereignty over the unending and unbroken seventh-day Sabbath. It's my personal belief that Torah obedience isn't based on what I see around me, but only on what Yah said, which is often contrary to what feels natural and what the world I live in embraces. Only that which they can observe with their eyes. In Enoch 1, the sin of the watchers was to redirect the focus of the people from the Most High Himself and place it on observance of the luminary cycles, particularly observance of the moon. Dalit is the door. The number four is represented by the Hebrew letter Dalit, which represents a door. The twelve constellations are popularly called the zodiac, which comes from the word sodi, meaning the way or the pathway. So the biblical calendar uses twelve units of time represented by the stars or the constellations, which were anciently called sodi, and the number four, which is the dalit. So 360 plus four gives us the way or pathway, and the door. In Matthew seven thirteen through 14, Yeshua says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way, which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, please understand, I'm certainly not suggesting that the solar calendar provides our salvation, but it does point us directly to the stars which encapsulate the entire plan of salvation from Genesis to Revelation. 
the Son, like Yeshua, tells us to turn back to the oath of sevening with our Creator. The biblical calendar literally depicts the narrow path and the narrow gate of Yeshua. Our entire faith and walk is not based on sight, but on the oaths of Yah Elohim. Do you believe in coincidence? The Aaronic priesthood was called Zadok. Zadok means righteous, from Zadok, which means to be righteous or to be just. The Sod, or Zod, level understanding is the hidden meaning or the righteous meaning. The word Sodi or Zodi is the root word for zodiac. Sodi means the way or the pathway. The letter Dalit represents the door. The Dalit is also the number four. There are four seasons with four solar signs or doors. The four seasons create a door for the unit of time called years. The number seven is the root word for oath, Shavua, and the unit of time which Yah taught us to use. On day 364, the four seasons and the units of seven days agree on a complete year. Genesis 1, 14-17 never mentions a unit of time called months. Neither stellar months, lunar months, or solar months, nor gives any indication to use the term months at all to establish years. The seasons and the days, seven, seven days of creation, alone are what establishes a year, beginning on the fourth day of creation when the first year began with the stars being placed in the heavens. Now, the Jewish calendar is a lunisolar calendar. It was essentially canonized by Hillel II between 320 and 365 CE, which is why it is called the Hillel II calendar. Halal II was the 18th or 19th Nasi or leader prince of the rabbinic court system called the Sanhedrin, which ceased to exist in 425 CE. In 197 before the Common Era or BCE, Judea became a province of the Seleucid Empire, that's the Greeks, which was ruled by the Syrian successors of Alexander the Great. Many Jews weren't upset over this. In fact, they became known as Hellenistic Jews because they eagerly wished to embrace everything that the Greek culture had to offer. This resulted in an intense cultural battle between some of the Hellenistic Jewish leaders and the temple priests over the calendar. The Hellenistic Jews wanted to conform timekeeping with the Greek lunar calendar, while the priests believed that this calendar was pagan and shouldn't be mixed with the true worship of Yah Elohim. While the priests controlled the temple and worship system, there was also a civil system in place called the assembly, which functioned directly under the leadership of the high priest. We also see this in the wilderness, where Aaron and the Levites were in the temple serving, and the 70 elders which represented each of the 12 tribes in civil matters were in the camp. The high priest was the Nasi, or the prince leader, since Aaron's rod had budded as a sign that Yah gave the Aaronic priesthood sole authority over the twelve tribes in religious matters. Now we can read in number 17, verse 10, And Yah said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony, to be kept for a token against the rebels, and thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from me that they die not. In 191 BCE, some powerful Jewish leaders essentially voted that they had no confidence in the priest and they wanted this power removed, which they had held since Moses' tabernacle in the wilderness. It was simply put, another Korah's rebellion. A position was created within the Sanhedrin for a single leader who would now carry the title Nasi and represent the supreme authority of the Sanhedrin. Thus, the divine mandate of Nasi became a political and elected position only. Like the House of Israel had done previously, 
Judah now did more wickedly than her sister by electing their own high priests and leaders and rejecting the sons of Aaron in the temple at Jerusalem. In 187 BCE, the last Aaronic high priest, Onias III, began to lead a resistance by the Zadokite priests to try to stop the Hellenistic infiltration. But in 175 BCE, Antiochus Epiphanes, or Epiphanes, deposed him from his position and replaced him with his brother Jason, a Hellenistic sympathizer. Onias III and the Zadok priests kept fighting, but eventually Onias III had to flee for his life, and he was murdered in 171 BCE. This was the last rightful Aaronic high priest in the temple at Jerusalem. Powerful Jews began to systematically hunt down and kill their opposition, which were the Zadok priests, and most of them fled for their lives. Much of this history is well known today, but what isn't as well known is that Abraham was also called the Nasi, and so were all of his sons. Aaron, the high priest, was the chief Nasi before the title was solely given to the elected leader of the Sanhedrin, of which Hillel II was the 19th or 20th elected Nasi in 320 CE. The high priests were solely responsible for the proper observance of the biblical calendar, but after they were replaced by the leader of the Sanhedrin, the elected Nasi, took over this position. While the word Nasi in Hebrew means prince or leader, and its root word Nasa means exalted or lifted up, it has a different meaning in Aramaic, which is still closely related. In Aramaic, the word nasi means to intercalate. Naturally, after the title of nasi was transferred to the Sanhedrin, the elected nasi began to dictate the intercalation based on the lunar calendar system instead of the solar calendar. However, we can still see in the Aramaic that the high priest, the chief nasi of Levi and Israel, is directly related to the process of intercalation and the biblical calendar. We all know the system of intercalation used in the Jewish lunar calendar, which makes it a loony solar calendar using two different systems, observance of the moon and an unbroken seventh-day weekly Sabbath. Not even the Hellenized Jews dared break the cycle of seven days, which represents Yah's covenant oath. The Jewish lunar calendar system uses the vernal equinox as a guide for when to add 30 days, the 13th month called Adar II, Adar meaning cold. At the end of every third year, which is why it is referred to as a luny solar calendar. A 13th month is required because the lunar cycle falls behind the vernal equinox around 10 days every year, and 10 times 3 equals 30 days. Now, because of the vernal equinox falling on the 365th day, it actually falls behind about 11 days with the solar cycle of the vernal equinox, which also shows us that by intercalating 30 days only, at the end of every third year, there was at some point a recognition of a 364th day. The Zadok priests called the Hellenized Jews who changed the biblical calendar from solar to lunar observance the sons of darkness, and they called themselves the sons of light in the war scroll. In the Hebrew, the word Hillel, often translated as praise, comes from the root word halal, which means to shine. Halal occurs in 140 verses in the Tanakh. I believe that the word halal, although it can represent any shining luminary, is more specifically referring to the sun and the stars because it is only applied directly to them. Halal to shine forth in 1 Chronicles 23.30 and to stand every morning to thank and Halal, Yah, and likewise at even. The sign which occurs every morning is the sun, and this sign is replaced by the stars at even as it sets in the west. Psalm 113.3, from the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, 
Yah's name is to be halaled. Job 31, 26, if I beheld the sun when it halal or the moon walking in brightness, which is yagar. In Psalm 150, verse 1, praise or halal ye Yah. Praise halal Elohim in his sanctuary. Halal him in the firmament of his power. Recall that Psalm 19.4 describes the stars as a tabernacle for the sun. Isaiah 13.10 For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not halal, give their light or shine. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to naga, to shine. If you do a word search, you will see that the references to praise using halal are almost all in the setting of the temple with the priest. The Jewish Sanhedrin calendar, or Hallel II. So the Jewish Sanhedrin usurped the authority of the Aaronic priesthood in 191 BCE, turning it into a political position. Let's look at the names of the Nasi of the Sanhedrin. Here, the names seem very separate, very different individuals. But starting with number five, we have Hillel, the elder, which is the root is Halal. And then we have Shimon ben Hillel and Shammai. And then we have Rabban Gamaliel, the elder, Rabban Shimon ben Gamaliel, Rabban Yochanan ben Zekai, Rabban Gamaliel II of Yavne, Rabbi Eliezer ben Azariah, Rabban Shimon ben Gamaliel II, Rabbi Judah the first Hanasi, then Gamaliel the third, Judah the second Nasiah, Gamaliel the fourth, Judah the third Nasiah, Hillel the second, Gamaliel the fifth, Judah the fourth, and last Gamaliel the sixth. It appears that the Sanhedrin attempted to create a family legacy to imitate the Aaronic priesthood, even using the word Gamaliel, or Gamol-el, after the first order of the six-year priestly cycle, Gamol. They also awarded exalted titles such as Rabban and used the term Hillel, which also strongly suggests an association with the priesthood and the worship of the temple. By all appearances, this was an attempt to recreate the Aaronic priesthood while assuming all of their duties, in particular the biblical calendar. I've heard the criticism that we should not be attempting to change the biblical calendar because we do not have the authority to change the Jewish calendar established by the priests. I have to say quite bluntly that Yah did not give this authority to any of the men listed above, including Hillel II. All that we have today regarding the original biblical calendar is found in the writings of the Zadok priests in the Dead Sea Scrolls who died trying to preserve it. They buried these scrolls in caves to keep them from being destroyed by the sons of darkness. We are not trying to usurp their authority, like the Sanhedrin and Hillel too did, but rather we are trying to restore the calendar along with the faith once delivered to the saints. The earth literally opened up to help the woman in 1948 with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now let's look quickly at the Islamic lunar calendar. The Islamic calendar is a straight lunar calendar independent of the solar cycle, and thus it has no ability to reckon the alignment of the seasons, nor does it even try. This means that after 12 lunar cycles have completed, the following cycle is month one of the next year. This is determined by visually sighting the waxing crescent, or Hillel, following the new moon. Although this method creates variances between the observation and the astronomical lunar calculations, the calendar is never more than three days off from the calculations. 
The dates of religious holidays, however, are not fixed and can be moved around the calendar to provide for more seasonal weather during observances, such as pilgrimages to Mecca. Various Muslim nations use different reckoning methods, and differences in weather conditions and visibility result in variances between the calendar dates observed from one nation to the next. However, most Islamic nations will automatically declare the evening of the 30th day to be the start of the next month if the crescent is not sighted. Intercalation, which is called nasi, is considered to be an act of disbelief. We can read what Muhammad said in Surah 9. The number of the months with God is 12 in the book of God. The day that he created the heavens and the earth, four of them are sacred. That is the right religion. So wrong not each other during them and fight the unbelievers totally, even as they fight you totally, and know that God is with the God-fearing. Know that intercalation, nasi, is an addition to disbelief. Those who disbelieve are led to error, thereby making it lawful in one year and forbidden in another in order to adjust the number of the months made sacred by God and make the sacred ones permissible. The evil of their course appears pleasing to them, but God gives no guidance to those who disbelieve. So you can see very strongly that Muhammad was against any form of intercalation called nasi. Of course, that system would not work with the biblical calendar, which is agricultural based and must align with the four seasons of the year. Now, the solar Christian Gregorian calendar. On the Christian Gregorian calendar, named after Pope Gregory, the year begins in the winter, about 10 days after the winter solstice on January 1st. However, the month names themselves tell us that the proper start of the calendar should be in March. For example, September means seven, sept, septenary, seven. October, octo means eight. November means nine. December means 10, showing that January should be month 11 and February should be month 12. Every fourth year, there are 366 days between vernal equinoxes, which is added as the 29th day of February, called a leap year, in order to avoid adding an extra day in the middle of March, although the extra day first appears at the autumnal equinox. The religious holiday of Easter is always on a fixed day of the week, Sunday, but is determined by the first full moon following the vernal equinox, so the date shifts from year to year. It might be in late March or late April or somewhere in between. The holiday of Christmas is tied to a specific date, December 25th, which in turn shifts weekdays from year to year. December 25th was the birth date of the pagan gods at the winter solstice, which would make it the beginning of month 10, not the end of month 12, as we can see in the word December, which means 10. It is my personal belief that Yeshua was born in the month of Abib, as Isaiah 53, 2 says, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry or barren ground. Now the Zadok priestly calendar. Many scholars agree that the ancient temple calendar in Jerusalem was a solar calendar. In the Talmudic and Mishnaic literature, there are hints that the calendar system was changed to a different calendar system at some point during the Second Temple era. The current Jewish lunar calendar, which is called Hillel II, follows the waxing crescent, or Halal, as the Muslims call it. Basically, the rabbinic leaders in the Second Temple era, which replaced the temple priest, determined that they had been given the authority by Elohim to declare the calendar, which they interpreted to mean they could also determine the calendar system. Similarly, Roman Catholicism determined that because Yeshua could forgive sins and because they were his representatives on earth, that they also had been given the authority to absolve sins, which they did for many, many hundreds of years by selling forgiveness 
for money. You could give enough money to the church and be absolved of all your future sins, regardless of what they were. As part of the platform of the Great Reformation of Protest, or the Protestant theology, rejected this church teaching, reverting back to the scriptural position that only Yah alone could forgive sins. As a result of the growing tension between the believers in Yeshua and the Jews who rejected Yeshua as the Messiah during the first century CE, the rabbinic leader Akiva placed a strong censorship on the reading of any outside books, meaning any writings with which they did not approve. This led to canonizing what is today called the Old Testament, or the Tanakh. However, when the Pharisees took over the position of the Nasi in the Sanhedrin, they also determined that there would be no more scriptures written, but they would only be interpreted from that point forward since there were no more Aaronic priests. At this point, they also determined which writings would be preserved and which writings would be on the outside. Later, Roman Catholicism did the same by canonizing the New Testament or the Brit Hadashah. So we have calendar tradition, but not necessarily fact. Because the solar equinox phenomena alone within the stars brings in the years exactly. There are no lunar cycles which announce any of these seasons, much less can demarcate a year, as we can see with the Islamic calendar. There is no lunar equivalent to the sun and the stars. This explains why the Jewish lunar calendar still uses the vernal equinox as a guide when adding the 13th month in order to realign with the season of spring, which of course is based on the sun and the stars. So while the Jewish lunar calendar uses the moon cycle to establish months and feast days, they ignore the moon to calculate the Sabbath day, which is the first feast mentioned in Leviticus 23, by using a separate system of calculation. There is, of course, no scriptural support for divorcing the Sabbath day calendar from the other feast days calendars, and thereby using two separate systems. In Leviticus 23, it looks like one calendar system was clearly intended. Lunar Feasts and Lunar Sabbaths Due to the absence of scriptural support for two separate calendars for the Feasts of Leviticus 23, some have logically concluded that all of the appointed times should follow one calendar system. I agree. However, for those who adopt the lunar cycle 100% as their calendar system, they follow what is called a lunar Sabbath, which occurs seven days after the 2% crescent moon, or Hillel, is sighted. Despite some disagreements, the result is that their weekly Sabbaths always land on the 7th or 8th, 14th or 15th, 21st or 22nd, 28th or 29th of every lunar cycle. There are two groups, the 7, 14, 21, and they dispute and argue on debate quite a bit with the other group, which is the 8, 15, 22 group. This is then followed by an extended Sabbath day, which can last two to three days until the next 2% crescent is spotted ushering in day one of the following month. However, this calendar causes many difficulties and is very disorganized due to the multiple Sabbath days at the end of each month, where the Sabbath day literally extends for two or three days, as well as the shifting of the Sabbath day through the weekdays from month to month. Most people find it very difficult to hold down a steady job and provide for their families while at the same time desiring to be obedient to their Creator and observe His Sabbath day as commanded. Calculation The concept of calculation is firmly established in Genesis chapter 1. Yahlohim added light and then divided it from the darkness. Yah added a firmament and then divided the waters. Yah added the waters together under heaven and called them seas, etc. The entire week of creation was performed in a perfect unit of seven days, and the seventh day was set apart as holy because Yahlohim rested from his work. These seven days is what forms the backbone of the septenary calendar, which means that it is established in multiples of seven the concept of a day is given first in Genesis 1, 3-4 by the presence of light called Boker, 
which precedes each of the creation day's work. But the ability for signs and seasons and days and years does not appear until the fourth day of creation. Thus, the first year could not begin until the fourth day of creation when the stars were placed in the sky with the great light. Note the absolute lack of a month being mentioned, much less signaled by a luminary sign. If the seasons, days, and years are determined by the sun and stars, then why would we switch to the moon and create a unit of time called a Kodesh? Continuing with the system of calculation for solar months just makes much more sense. In the stellar cycle, the stars form the base 360 degree circle of 12 units of time containing 30 degrees each. However, the stars alone cannot dictate years within their proper seasons for agricultural cycles and feast days, as the days must also dictate a year in Genesis 1.14. This is why it's impossible to use only the constellations to determine the biblical calendar year because the stars move forward incrementally independent of the seasons. 6,000 years ago, the vernal equinox rose in the constellation Taurus, and the north star wasn't Polaris, but was the star called Thuban in the constellation of Draco the dragon. The constellation Draco derived from the Latin term draconum, which means huge serpent. Draco never sets below the horizon in the northern hemisphere and is therefore always visible. The head of Draco forms a trapezoid just north of Hercules, which is in the constellation of Scorpio, and its body winds its way through the sky to end between the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper in the constellation of Cancer. From early to mid-October, which corresponds on the biblical calendar to the early and middle part of the seventh month, a meteor shower called the Draconids appears to radiate from Draco's head. The former North Star, Thuban, or Alpha Darconis, forms the tail. The serpent Leviathan may be a reference to this star in scripture, whose tail spans one-third of the stars. The book of Job has references to Leviathan as well as the big and little dipper called the bear and her cubs. The Little Dipper, or Cubs, is where the North Star is located today in the constellation of Cancer. The constellation of Ophiuchus is called the Serpent Bearer, creating an asterism of a man holding a serpent in his hands. This, if you'll recall, was the sign that Yah told Moses to use to show the people that he had sent him. Moses threw down his shepherd's staff and it turned into a water serpent. And then when he grasped it by its tail, it became a harmless staff once again. Moses was the shepherd who had been given power over the serpent. Yeshua, the prophet like Moses, is the one who finally defeated the serpent when he was lifted up between heaven and earth on the stake. He brings healing from the death of the serpent to all those who look upon him. Without the additional one day of motion creating this clear distinction on the vernal equinox, the solar and stellar cycles would simply be two more endless cycles with no clear exit ramp for years. It is the distinct westerly motion of the vernal equinox traveling counter to the easterly motion of the sun and stars on the 365th day, which provides the obvious sign for where we should look to establish the head of the year. This is also where I find the condescending attitudes of some scholars to be particularly annoying when they mock Enoch 1 and the 364-day perfect year. The 364-day year isn't based on complex math equations by theoretical science majors trying to find dark matter while contemplating string theory. It is predicated on basic observation of the luminary cycles, just as any one of us can do today and through the lens of Torah. Simple observation instead of hypothetical theories. If one can set aside the competing and contradicting theories of godless men and just look up at the sky, then the observations of Enoch 1 will make much more sense. In addition, it is important to note that ancient people believed in a flat, geocentric model Earth rather than the modern heliocentric spinning globe model. 
Regardless of where you stand on flat earth, you will be best served reading Enoch 1 from the perspective of the ancients who wrote it. The Passage of Millennia the vernal equinox also records the passage of 1,080-year units of time through the stars for a total of 2,160 years per constellation. 1,080 plus 1,080 equals 2,160 years per constellation. My research partner created a biblical timeline early in our time of collaborating together which has produced many amazing discoveries. One astonishing discovery was that in the biblical timeline, we found significant events occurring in 1,008 year units of time. This number proved to be a significant calendar number. 1,080 minus 1,008 equals 72 years, which is how long it takes for the constellations to rotate one degree. 72 is also the number of biblical feasts once you include the free will offerings of the first fruits of new wine and the first fruits of new oil, which are mentioned with barley and wheat repeatedly throughout scripture as first fruits. 70 plus 2 equals 72. So 70 feast days plus new wine and new oil gives you 72 total. Note how these subtracted years add up to the number 144. 72 plus 72 is 144, which times 1,000 equals the number of elect in Revelation. 144 times 1,000 equals 144,000 of the elect. And of course, the 144,000 are from the 12 tribes of Israel as depicted by Joseph and his brothers in Genesis 37 as the constellations. Also note that the woman who appeared as a great wonder in heaven in Revelation 12 has the 12 stars around her head. The 12 stars represent the plan of salvation and the family of Yah who keep his commandments. In Revelation 12, 6, we see that the woman flees to the wilderness where she is fed for 1,000 260 days. Now compare 2,160 with 1,260 and remember her crown of 12 stars. The number 21 is merely transposed to create a 12. Thus the woman and the procession of the equinoxes through the 12 constellations appear directly connected. The earth indeed opened its mouth in the form of the Dead Sea Scrolls to help the woman of the end times. Now remember at creation week and the seven day cycle which Yah established from the beginning. Yah was already counting off the seven days before he had even placed the motion of the sun and stars in the heavens together on the fourth day which began the first biblical year. The entire process of creation was based on adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing within a measurement of seven. Yah continues showing us how to count like he does through the use of jubilee cycles, seven times seven, and Shemitah or sabbatical years, seven plus seven plus seven. It is no coincidence that all seven commanded feasts occur within the first seven months. Passover and unleavened bread is a seven day feast. You can count by sevens to reach the feast of Shavuot. Yom Teruah is on the first day of the seventh month, and the Feast of Sukkot is seven days plus the eighth day, which is called addition or the last great day. The number seven is well established as the original calendar number, and for Yah to establish a biblical year, which has a broken cycle of sevens, isn't likely. After all, seven is the backbone of the calendar itself. So while the stellar cycle may equal 360 degrees, the biblical calendar must not end with a broken seven-day cycle. Any attempt to follow a strict adherence to the luminary cycles will always result in a broken seven-day cycle because none of the luminary cycles are divisible by seven. But the sun, which divided the light from the dark on day one, gives us the sign for days, which indeed points us to the covenant of seven.
Now we have to choose regarding the traditions of men and the scriptures. The canonization process of both the Jews and the Roman Catholic Church occurred largely because of the religious sects fighting for supremacy and staking out positions against the other. This explains why there is such an enduring disdain between the two religions. Jews are allowed to believe in anything and still be considered Jewish, except for Yeshua as their Messiah. Belief in Yeshua by a Jew is often viewed by the religious establishment as traitorous to their faith. Perhaps because the oppressors of the Jews were the Romans, who began to rule over them in 67 BCE, they followed a solar calendar, so the Jews determined to follow a lunar calendar. Apparently, they liked the Greeks much more than the Romans. Roman Catholicism, having retained the power of government for millennia, were outspoken about the so-called evil of the Jews and the synagogue of Satan. Very early in the Roman Catholic tradition, anything which was considered to be Jewish, such as keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath or the biblical feasts and eating kosher, were forbidden. Following any of these biblical commandments today in modern Christianity, which has been handed directly down to us from the Roman Catholic Church, is viewed as traitorous to the faith of Yeshua. The result of these feuding religions was that scriptural truths were rejected on both sides and replaced with man-made commandments and man-made doctrines, which bolstered the opposing traditions and the hard lines which they had drawn. This feud has still shaped our mindsets and all of our religious traditions to this very day. Now, I'm going to go ahead and split this study into two. So this is going to conclude part four, and I will begin the next study, part five. I will discuss and compare the different biblical calendars, the Enoch calendars, and the Zadok calendars specifically, which are most popularly being explored today. Thank you so much for joining me for this study, and shalom. Shalom.